So the next one is item 29, pathway survivability level zero. So what is the requirement for a pathway which has a survivability um, mode? For level zero, shall not be required to have any provisions for pathway survivability. So there's a level, guys. If we will consider a pathway with survivability option, there is actually three. You will see here, pathway survivability zero, level zero, level one, level two, level three. But it doesn't mean, guys, that we need to comply this survivability, uh, this all pathway survivability. So either if in the project specification, if they require to have a pathway survivability, either of this level one, level two, level three will be applied. So what is the difference between level one, level two, level three? So for level one, it shall consist of pathways in buildings in item 30, just refer to item 30 guys. Level one shall consist of pathways in buildings that are fully sprinklered, okay? So in level two, shall consist one or more. So one or more. Either you have a cable with a rating of CI, okay, circuit integrity, two hours fire rated, or a two hour cable, two hour fire rated cable system, or a two hour fire rated enclosure installed inside the enclosure, your cable installed at, uh, inside the 2R5 enclosure, or other performance alternatives. So this is level 2. Either it consists one or more of the following. In level 3, it's just a level 2, guys. It's like survivability level 2 with the additional of fully sprinkler. So these are the, no, the the level, level 3. It's combination of level 2 and level 1. Okay? So, let's take care of these uh, notes which I, read, I wrote in the first slides. So, we have this note 2 here in you remember this separation that I discussed? Should be um the primary and the redundant cable shall not be mixed together. There's an exemption, guys, in in two, we will read. So if you have a cable which is mixed together, as long as the distance does not exceed three meters and it's only a single drops to an in-well devices or appliances, and the room which will not, will be affected in case of failure is only 93 square meter, then it doesn't uh, matter anymore, no? So, when we have, uh, let's say, a sounder or a pull station with a cable of both incoming and outgoing, then it's permitted, guys, as long as it's uh, not exceeding three meters, and in the ratio, to, and it's for individual devices with an affected area of not more than 93 square meter. Then it's not, uh, it's not, uh, no, accept. I mean, it's not applicable. But for a, for a fire alarm control panel, it's uh, mandatory to separate both in incoming and outgoing. Okay, so we will now proceed on chapter 17 of NAPA 72. In this chapter, it will uh, we will be discussing about the initiating devices, what is the requirement. So, in clause 17.4.2, section 17.4.2, it's, it's uh, addressing the requirements for all initiating devices. What is the requirement? We're subject to mechanical damage. An initiating device shall be protected or a mechanical guard shall be used. So guys, whenever 
there's a possibility that your devices, fire alarm devices, will be damaged by the operation within the building. Let's say in warehouse, there are some part where the devices might be exposed to damage because of uh, the scope of work inside the no inside the warehouse. Then we need to consider some kind of uh, mechanical guard which is available from the manufacturer but just make sure that this is listed to that particular device so that is the requirement and another one is item 2 initiating devices shall be installed in a manner that provides accessibility so we don't just locate the detector let's say in the ceiling anywhere we want as per the spacing, let's say if we if we even follow the spacing, it doesn't uh, means that it's acceptable already. We need to make sure that the location of devices are properly coordinated with other services. Make sure that that particular location of detector is not close to the diffuser or not uh, above the H back duct where it's not accessible when you're going to maintain it reach the detector it's hard for you because it's uh, covered by cable tray or tack so we need to make sure that all the devices are accessible okay and for item 3 where fire detectors are installed in the concealed locations or more than 3 meters above the finished floor they are required to have a remote lead indicator so that's why in uh, all concealed location like in detector above ceiling or detector which is located in the raised floor they're always uh, i mean they're always provided with remote led like what i discussed earlier now this remote led was the function it is to give indication of alarm because once you install those devices concealed which is not uh, readily visible by the people uh, they cannot uh, no, they cannot locate the device easily because this uh, LED is not visible now so you have to provide remote LED okay now we will proceed on the first uh, type of uh, detector which is the spot type heat detector under chapter 17.6 section 17.6 of NEPA what you will see in this table is there's a different temperature rating range of heat detector. You remember last time I just uh, sample one uh, type of heat detector fix a temperature which is 68 degrees here. So if your rating of your heat detector is 68 degrees, it means it will be somewhere around in this range of heat detector, 58 to 79. That means that is ordinary temperature. Uh, heat detector so this temperature range will uh, that we're going to select is uh, will depend on which environment you will apply it it will uh, depends on the ceiling temperature or the, the maximum ambient ceiling temperature which is to be expected in the room that you will install the heat detector if your heat uh, maximum ceiling temperature is 28 degrees only in in the room, then you can go with the low temperature, which is within 39 to 57. But if your maximum ceiling temperature will be 47, then you might need a uh, no, more temperature range like ordinary. Okay, so this is how we select our heat detector. It's based on maximum ceiling temperature. This is how we select our fixed type heat detector. What is the requirement detector spacing for smooth ceiling? When we say guys smooth ceiling, it means we don't have any uh, structural beams or joists, solid joists, or the ceiling is not uh, sloping. So it's like a flat ceiling, smooth without any obstruction so if there's no obstruction then the listed spacing shall be maintained between detector this listed spacing guys uh, you will see it from the catalog of the detector heat detector 
from different manufacturer they have their own listed spacing it can be 15 meters it can be 9 meters it can be more so we have to check the catalog of uh, heat detector that we are designing but if we will only refer to um, NAPA we can follow 15 meters which is the latest uh, spacing so spacing between detector is let's say 15 meters in the absence of manufacturer and the spacing between the detector and the wall if that is the, the wall shall be not more than one half of the spacing so if it's 15 meters your spacing from detector to the wall shall not be more than 7.5 which is one half of your spacing and all points on the ceiling shall have a detector within a distance equal to or less than 0.7 times the distance spacing so you just multiply the 0.7 to the listed spacing which is let's say here in NPA 15 you multiply 0.7 to 15 and that will be your like radius so within that radius of their heat detector so all the points in the ceiling shall be covered by that particular radius of the detector otherwise you need to add more then you have you have to uh, take care of the location of your heat detector from the wall or from the sides it there uh, the detector shall not be located less than 100 millimeters from the wall so this is what we call dead spot guys smoke will not reach this uh, area in the wall or from the ceiling to the wall so be sure that your detector is located not less than 100 from the wall or if it's located if your detector is mounted to the wall it should be located or installed between 100 to 300 mm from the ceiling okay to avoid this dead spot otherwise your heat detector will not activate it will not be activated it will be trough smoke will not or heat will not uh, reach that area of the the wall so this is the one guys what i explained earlier you will have your s say in npa 72 this s is 15 otherwise you will follow the spacing per manufacturer so just check there so if it's 15 then one up from the wall it should be 7.5 maximum and for radius 0.7 so what is 0.7 of your spacing so it should be all points in the ceiling shall be within the radius of your heat detector that is how we design our uh, detector in the area so this is your area so you have to distribute the spacing evenly s so it's one is 15 15 15 then from the wall for your last detector to the wall should be what more than one half of your spacing which is 7.5 and all points within the ceiling shall be within 0.7 or the radius 0.7 times the spacing which is 15 meters this is our sample okay so this is what i said earlier these are the dead spot don't put your detector here that's why it's here neighbor here otherwise your detector will not be activated or if your detector is located uh, mounted to the wall it should be located within 100 to 300 here only otherwise if you put your detector again here this part again it's in the dead spot okay so that is more uh, the requirements for smooth ceiling for solid joists there's another requirement you have to take care when you have a solid joist the spacing of heat between heat detector at right angle to the solid joist shall not exceed one half and detectors shall be mounted at the bottom of the solid joist what does it mean so these are your joists this line so these are all joists so the code says if you have a joist this detector spacing should be one half now instead of uh, your spacing let's say 15 now my detector spacing will be 7.5 going to the other heat detector and your heat detector will be located at the bottom no bottom of the beams should they should be located at the bottom of the beams 
Okay? And your detector to the wall will be one fourth of your smooth uh, your spacing, one fourth of 15 meters. Okay? So that is a requirement. And for beam construction, if beam projects more than 100 mm from the ceiling, then the spacing of heat detector where measured at right angles to the solid joist shall not exceed two-thirds of the listed spacing. So there's totally different requirement now huh? if your beam depth is more than 100. And if beams project no more than 460 from the ceiling and more than 2.4 on the center, I mean the, cent uh, the spacing between beam detector is uh, more than 2.4, then each bay formed by beam shall be treated as separate area. But if your beam project less than 300 mm and your spacing between beam is less than 2.4, then it's permitted to be located at the bottom of the beams. Okay? So that is the requirement for beams uh, when you have a beam. So for sloping ceiling, the requirements are if the slope of the ceiling is less than 30 degrees, then all detectors shall be spaced using the height of the peak. Uh, we will check it later on, guys, in the image so we can easily understand this. If the slope of the ceiling is 30 degrees or more, all detectors other than those located in the peak shall be spaced using the average slope height or the height of the peak. Spacing shall be measured along horizontal projection of the ceiling in accordance with the type of ceiling construction. A row of detectors shall be placed first located within 910, of the peak, uh, 910 mm of the peak of the ceiling. So this is the image for sloping ceiling, guys. So if you have a peak ceiling, you don't want to put your detector within here, within 100 mm from the peak. Why? This is again, guys, a dead spot in in the ceiling. So we will follow the same. That's why um, detector shall be provided. Heat detector shall be provided here within 910 mm. No, from the center point within 910, and from the peak to 100 mm. These are the place where you. Um, you are safe to provide your detector anywhere here. So from that detector going to the other one, we will follow the same spacing as, but we're, me we're measuring it horizontally, yeah? not parallel to the roof. So this is how we measure the spacing. Okay, and from the last point in the ceiling or in the wall, it's one half, still one half of the spacing. So. This is how we space our detector in sloping ceiling. The other factor that we have to consider in uh, designing a spot type heat detector is there will be a reduction in the coverage if your ceiling height is more than or more uh, more than or equal to three meters. So what you will see here, guys, is our ceiling height is from zero. What you will see here, from zero to three meters, your spacing is 100%. So if, say, your spacing is 15 meters, 100% of 15 meters is 15. But if your ceiling is from 3 meters, starting from 3 meters ceiling height to 3.7 meters, then your spacing will be like 0.91 only of your, spa of your spacing. So how much is that? If we will calculate. Uh, let's calculate it, guys. These are the percentage only. So... 0.91% of, uh, of 15 meters 
that will be your spacing now. So it's reduced. So what happens if you have ceiling height more than 3.7, 3.7 to 4.3? Then it will be reduced again to 84% to of your spacing. So what is 84% of, uh, of 15 meters? Until 9.1, which is the maximum height that heat can be mounted is. You will only have 34% now spacing what will happen you will have a lot of heat detectors installed in the area if you have a height of 9.1 meters there's a lot of heat detector to install because your spacing now will be 34 percent of 15 meters which is very less so be careful of this ceiling reduction guys now we will move to the chapter in NAP 72 about spot type smoke detector so the first requirement is for smooth ceiling spacing okay so don't need to explain again what is uh, smooth ceiling like what i said earlier it's just smooth there's no obstruction okay what is the requirement spacing between detector is 9.1 smoke detector and one half of the spacing measured at right angle to the wall or partition all points in the ceiling shall have a detector within a distance equal to or less than 0.7 times the listed spacing. And at all cases, the manufacturer's public instruction shall be followed. So, this is it, guys. This is 9.1 meters between detector and detector to the wall shall not be more than one half the listed spacing and or no points in the ceiling shall be more than 0.7 of times the, the spacing which is your radius like in what i explained in heat detector before okay so for solid joist or beam construction the spacing requirement is if you have a beam depth which is less than 10% of the ceiling height, then we can consider that as smooth ceiling. Okay, so the 9.1 meter spacing will be applied, same as smooth ceiling. You can either smooth uh, install the detector in the ceiling or bottom of the beams, no problem. But if your beam depth is more than 10% of the ceiling height, and um the beam spacing is more than 40 percent of the ceiling height then a spot type detect smoke detector shall be provided in every beam packet so that is the requirement but if your beam depth is more than 10 percent of the ceiling height but the spacing between beam beam is less than 40%, then we can um, use this spacing of uh, of a smooth ceiling spacing within the beam packet, inside the beam packet, or uh, one, half the, one half of the smooth ceiling spacing in direction perpendicular to the beams so we can do like that if your beam spacing is less than 40 percent of the ceiling height but once it's more than 40 percent the beam spacing then you have to no there's no choice for us you have to put smoke detector in each beam packet okay you can if your beam spacing is less than 40% of the ceiling height, you can either put the smoke detector in the ceiling or in the bottom of the beams. So this is how it works. If your beam spacing is more than 40% of the ceiling height, and if your beam depth is more than 10% of the ceiling height, then you have to provide smoke detector 
in each packet. But if your beam depth is less than 40% of the ceiling height and your beam depth is 10% of the ceiling height, then um, you are not required to provide smoke detector in each packet but you have to maintain the spacing perpendicular to the beams. The spacing between the uh, detector shall be not more than one half of the ceiling spacing, which is, if it's 9.1, it should be 4, 4.5, okay? But if it's less than 10% of the ceiling height, the beam depth is less than 10% of the ceiling height, then it's like smooth ceiling only. So you can follow this spacing 9.1, okay? Now for sloping ceiling with beams running parallel upslope, this is, uh, okay, the following shall apply. The spot type shall be located on the ceiling with beam packets, okay? The ceiling height shall be taken as average height over slope. Spacing, this is like... Um, what we discussed earlier, so I will not discuss this one by one, but I will just show you in the drawing. So this is what it says. This is same like what in heat detector. You have to locate your detector from the peak of the slope. Na, uh, I mean within, within 910 meters from the horizontal and should be more than 100 meters from the peak. So this is dead spot. Same with the heat. Then the spacing between detector is, should be, shall be maintained here. So it's like 9.1 meters, 9.1. And here is one half of 9.1 is 4.5. But if you have, um, if you have a, a, a beam parallel to this slope, this is what it says. If you have a beam depth of less than 10% or equal to 10%, then you can have detector, your spacing between detector shall be after two beam packets but if your beam depth is uh, greater than 10 percent you're only allowed to have one packet so you will you will see here no this is the beam beam you have only one packet spacing but here when your beam depth is less than 10 percent if it's a sloping ceiling then you're allowed to up to have two packets meaning three beams Here, the number of beams is only two. Okay? And for shed ceiling, this is like sloping ceiling. So, okay, you just have to put your detector within uh, 910 from the peak. Then smooth, smooth spinning spacing will follow. Okay? S, 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 like we see here, air from the wall, one half. And in deciding a smoke detector, when you have a big air change per hour, where we have a high airflow, like in data center, then the coverage will be different compared to the standard that we consider. That 9.1 is derived from this coverage, 84. What is a square root of 84 is uh, will give you like uh, 9.1 meters as your spacing, okay? But when you have an air change per hour more than six, uh, 7.5 or 8 air change per hour minutes, 8 minutes for air change, I mean here 8 minutes for air change, if you have more than 8 minutes for air change, what will happen is your coverage will be less. So if you have an air uh, change of 2 minutes for air change, 
then what well, your coverage is 23 square meter only then it will be very less okay so in high airflow areas like data center you have to consider this table when you're providing the spacing okay so your 9.1 will not be your basis anymore which is derived from 84 square meter it might be from uh, if you have an airflow of 2 let's say 2 it means for air change then you will consider 23 what is square root of 23 it will give you the spacing now okay now uh, we will discuss the other type of detector which air sampling detector so what is air sampling detector like what I explained earlier it's uh, the more advanced type of smoke detector which is a uh, having a high sensitivity sensor so they are installed mostly in data centers and different type of environment where a normal spot type smoke detector cannot be installed okay so these are the major i mean the main clause <clears throat> that we can consider in ip 2 Each sampling port of an air sampling type smoke detector shall be treated as pot type. So when you are designing uh, an air sampling detector, when you're um, making the layout for the pipes and where you are locating where the sampling point will be, this is like same as how we are designing the smoke detector. There's no difference. The only difference is you install pipe instead of cable, okay? But the spacing between sampling point is the same as spot type. So there's no special uh, requirements for that, okay? So if you apply air sampling detector in high airflow areas, so just follow that coverage area from the table that I show you before. From that spacing, that will be your spacing now for high flow air areas. Uh, the thing is, when you have an air sampling detector, the maximum transport time shall not exceed 120 seconds. So make sure that when you make the design for air sampling detector and you calculate it from the software, make sure that <clears throat> the transport time is not exceeding 120 seconds. So that's another factor. Other one is sampling pipe network shall be designed on the basis of shall be supported by sound fluid dynamics. This is why I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> excuse me, that a calculation software must be used when you are designing or, or sampling detector. It should be supported with uh, <clears throat> a sound fluid dynamic software. It's like hydraulic calculation in sprinkler, something like that or in FM200, there's some calculation software that we're using, okay? So in every uh, air sampling pipe, there should be a label, like what it is shown here. Should be identified as smoke detector sampling tube. So in case that this detector is already operational in later or in the future maintenance, people will, um, in, this is to ensure that people who's maintaining the building will not disturb this uh, piping in case of uh, no, they're doing some maintenance. Otherwise, they may can mistakenly um, think of it like just a plumbing pipe, okay? So there should be a sticker, a label. So where you will apply it, a change in direction or in branches of piping, each side of penetration from walls from each side or other intervals on piping that provide visibility within the space. So, intervals of 6.1 meters, okay? So, this is the sample where we install our air sampling detector, like what I said. There's a lot of application where we can use this in high airflow areas, in high ceiling areas, or where we have a lot of, uh, I mean, where we have environment factors where we cannot install a normal spot type heat detector. So this one, it's installed in warehouse. So what you will see here in C, what is C? Uh, B, these are the stratified smoke layer, no? Because in high areas, 
there is uh, there is a stratification issue. What is stratification? This is stratification is the layer in height within a particular area where the smoke will not reach, will not rise anymore because of the height is a ceiling height is too high. So when the smoke reaches at, at this part, when the temperature of that smoke uh, it's equal to the ambient temperature, it will not rise anymore. So it's not like a, it will lose its uh, buoyancy. So smoke will stay in this part, will be trapped in this space. That's why this is, uh, aside from having a, a sampling point in this part, in the ceiling, in warehouse, they're also considering in some levels, some points, just to make sure that if in case there's a stratification happen within the building, within the area, it can still catch up the smoke. Okay? So A, sampling holes. This is where the holes are drilled. And C is, okay, sampling holes. Okay. So this is how it enters the sampling point, no? sampling holes. Smokes are, I mean, air are continuously drawn from the pipe to the sensor here, 24 hours. Once the smoke enters this and delivers to the sensor, once the threshold is, uh, alarm threshold is met, then fire alarm will activate, okay? The next type of detector is projected beam type detector. This type of detector shall be located in accordance with one of Foxer's public instruction. So you will not find any in the book. Or even for that uh, air sampling detector, you will not find any in the within the uh, standards, some design parameters. But you will find it from the manufacturer. So always we have to uh, refer to the manufacturer installation manual, okay? The beam length shall not exceed the maximum permitted by equipment listing, okay? So there is a beam length limitation between beam and sensor. If mirrors are used with projecting beams, the mirror shall be installed in accordance with manufacturer's public instruction. So this is what I mentioned earlier. We should always uh, refer to the man. Uh, the manual, installation manual of manufacturer when we are designing this type of detector. <clears throat> a projective beams type smoke detector shall be considered equivalent to row of spot, spot type detector for level and slope CV. So the so the requirement will be the same with what we have in discussed in this the ceiling and sloping ceiling application in the spot type. Okay, so this beam detector shall be mounted on stable surfaces to prevent pulse and erratic operation. Okay, this is important when we are installing our beam detector. It shall be mounted in a uh, stable wall or structural uh, surface. Otherwise, if it's moving, then what will happen? This uh, alignment will be, uh, no, will be um, change, then it will give us false alarm. The beam shall be designed so that small angular movements of the light source or receiver do not prevent operation due to smoke and do not cause a nu nuisance or intentional alarms. This is the one. Okay. The light path of projecting beam type detector shall be kept clear of obstacles of all time. So this beam when we are installing beam detector, there should be a clear line of sight. There should be no obstruction in that line of sight. Okay? It should be clear of uh, obstruction. That's why in this image, what you will see, this is the beam detector. This is your reflector or sensor or receiver. There should be a clear distance, clear line of sight within 50 meters. There should be no obstruction in this area. There should be no beams, otherwise it will raise fault or false alarm, okay? So within this 
coverage of 50 meters within the beam, there should be a clear line of sight. Okay, and your spacing, this is a sample of uh, spacing, beam length, within A to 100. You should follow, you should, should follow the manufacturer installation manual. Okay. <clears throat> Next one is duck mounted smoke detector. These are installed to prevent the circulation of dangerous quantities of smoke. A uh, detector approved for air duct shall be installed in the supply side of air handling as required by NFA 90. We will discuss it later on, NFA 90A. So, we are installing duct mounted smoke detector mainly either in supply or return or both. It depends based on the capacity of the airflow or the CFM. We will discuss it later on in 90A. Okay, but why we're installing duct mounted smoke detector in supply? This is to, uh, to detect the uh, dangerous quantity of smoke coming from the motor. And why we're installing duct detector in return is to avoid this recirculation of smoke to the area. Okay, so. For return, additional smoke detectors shall not be required to be installed in ducts where the air duct passes through. So there are some exemption. Where total coverage is installed in accordance with, I mean, in all areas of smoke compartmented served by the return air system, installation of additional detector listed for the air velocity present where the air is smoke compartment or in the duct system before the air enters in the return air system shall not be required, provided that the their function is accomplished by, so, just to understand it um, more, guys, this is the one. If you have uh, a plenum where there's no duct for SBAC, and this is your main uh, common return, to the AHU, then you are only required to provide detector here. Okay? Or if it's ducted, you can provide detector near to the air before it goes back to the common return. If you don't have a smoke compartmented. But here, when you have a smoke compartmented, then you have to provide before it leaves the compartment, you have to provide the duct, detec uh, the duct detector in each smoke compartment, okay? So when this triggers, this will trigger the particular dampers that penetrates this. It will close, okay? Separately. Okay, the next one is flame detector. The selection of radiant energy sensing detector shall be based on the following. So, when you are selecting a flame detector, it should match the spectral response of the detector to the spectral emission of the fires. So, what is the expected uh, emergency? I mean, uh, electromagnetic waves that it will me it will emit. Okay, minimizing the possibility of spurious nuisance alarms from nine fire source. So, you have to consider also some other uh, activity within the where you will apply this flame detector okay otherwise it will cause nuisance alarm so as a general rules radiant energy sensing fire detector shall be employed consistent with the listing on approval okay and inverse square law which defines the fire size versus distance curve okay detector quantity shall be based on the detector's viewing position so that no point required detection in the hazard area is subtracted or outside the field of view of at least one detector so when we are designing plane detector we have to make sure that we are following the manufacturer guidelines in designing flame detectors so in every manufacturer they are giving the field of view for particular flame of detector if you select one particular flame detector let's say it's 
UV flame detector or UV and IR flame detector, if you if you select this from different um, combustibles or flammables, there is a different field of view for that one. So there's a different uh, characteristic for each of these uh, type of flammables. There's a different field of view. Let's say for this example, we have this flame. Uh, we have we have this horizontal field of view of 45 or 90 degrees as you will see here 45 degrees and here it's also 45 degrees then uh, you will see this is 90 degrees field of view and what you will see your maximum distance is 100 feet okay so from the vertical field of view it will be the same so as long as you position your flame detector within this field of view. All this uh, area within this uh, field of view will be uh, monitored. This is how we design our flame detector. But make sure that you design your field of view based on what fuel or type of flammable liquid we have there because there's a different field of view for each of type of fuel, okay? Manual pull station. The operable part of manu manually actuated alarm initiating device shall be not less than 1.07 meters and not more than 1.22. So, like what I said earlier, it can be permitted to be single action or double action, or there's another listed protective covers these are, let's say, in the hospital, guys, we will uh, notice sometimes there's another cover in the manual pool station. This is uh, just a additional protection so children will not operate it accidentally. So when you reach, uh, when you raise that cover, it will give some buzzer alarm. So that is just, uh, this is the one, listed protected covers. So it can be installed in some particular occupancy, like in hospital. So, manual fire alarm boxes shall be installed, so they're un unobstructed, okay, we discussed that earlier. Manual fire alarm box, pool station or pool station shall be located 1.5 of each exit doorway and on each floor. So why, that's why, guys, in every exit doorway, exit door, there, sh there shall be manual pool station within 1.5 of that exit door. I'm not talking about exit access door, guys. It's exit doorway. Travel distance to the manual pool station shall not exceed 91 meters. And if you have a big door, entry door or exit door, which is more than 12.2 meters, you should have 1.5 at both sides. You have, uh, you should have, uh, you shall have a manual pool station at both sides. Okay. The next one is. Um, the audible notification appliance guys I will explain later on I, will, I have this standard installation details for each of the devices I will show you all this in that uh, installation details okay so don't worry about the image the, how it looks like how, how it, uh, it is installed now we will go now to the audible notification appliance there are two types of uh, requirements. One is for public mode and private mode. For public mode, the requirement only is you should have a sound level at least 15 dB above the average ambient sound level or the noise level or 5 dB above the maximum sound level having, having a duration of 60 seconds, okay? Which is measured at 1.5 meters from the finished floor line using a weighted scale. What's the difference, difference between two in private mode? It's uh, 10 dB only above the average ambient sound level or 5 dB above the maximum sound within two seconds, uh, 60 seconds duration, which is measured same level, 1.5 from the finish floor line, measuring using the A-weighted scale. Okay? In sleeping requirements, it's mandatory to have minimum at least 75 dB or otherwise 15 dB above the average ambient sound level or 5 dB above the maximum sound level 60 seconds 
but in no case this db will be less than 75 db okay in sleeping room it's not just about db that we're going to discuss but there is also a requirement that we're uh special requirement like a low frequency signal audio which is 520 hertz this is required by NAPA 72 to ensure that people who is sleeping will be awake during fire so we just don't need to uh, maintain this 75 dB at the same time you should we shall use a low frequency sounder okay at the middle of the bias so this is what I'm saying uh, there's already in you will you will find it an annexure the sample of uh, average ambient sound level to be expected in particular occupancy uh, this is just a guideline this is not a standard so in business occupancies there's an expected average ambient sound level of 55 indication of 4 to 5 so what you will do if you're using public mode you just add, add 15 db to this one then your required db should be minimum how much with 5 plus 15 it's 70 so for educational if you're using public mode then it will be 45 plus 15 60 and if you're using let's say for institutional let's say in hospital you're using private mode then it's only 10 db 60 db okay plus 10 but if you have the actual measurement of your ambient sound level like what's mentioned in the public or private mode if you have the actual measurement of the sound average um, uh, i mean the ambient sound level in the area if it's already defined at the area let's say all the equipments are there the exp uh, buildings are already operational then um it should be 5 db above the maximum sound level let's say there the maximum ambient sound level that you measured is uh, uh in, in in institutional is 55 instead of 50 within 60 seconds duration then that 60 will be your basis but plus 5 so 60 plus 5 is 65 will be it will be the same with if you consider 50 only because 50 plus 15 is 65 so that's the one okay so that's how we do our calculation for db this is the standard mounting for audible notification appliance wall mounted appliance shall have their tops above finished floors at height of not less than 2.29 okay so the top of the sounder or bell shall not be less than 2.29 and below the finish ceilings at distance of not less than 150 okay so should the you know the top should be not less than 150 from the ceiling or from the finish floor line the top should not be less than 2.29 so that's the requirement like what I said earlier guys I have the installation detail I will show it all for visible notification appliance it's the flasher the flash rate shall not exceed 2 plus per second or shall not be less than 1 plus per second or 100 Hertz okay throughout the listed voltage range so if the voltage range for flasher is 16 volts to 24 volts we need to make sure that the flash rate is not exceeding 2 hertz or less than 1 hertz within this voltage range okay and the maximum candela sh and shall not exceed 1000 candela or the color shall be clear or normal white for fire alarm use okay and for wall mounted appliance it shall be mounted that the end complete enter lens is not less than 2.3 2.03 and not greater than 2.44 above pinch floor level. what does it means because sometimes we have a sounder or strobe combination if you are using sounder and strobe there's a limitation for sounder and strobe right make sure that you 
both comply the requirements for sounder like what I discussed earlier. The tops shall not be less than 2.29 and at the same time your structure shall not be less than 2.03 the entire lens and not more than 2.44 above the penis floor. So both make sure that when you have a ball mounted horn and strobe both these parameters are maintained. Okay, and when you have the low ceiling heights, it's permitted to have 2.03. Where a low ceiling heights do not permit, I mean, sorry, where a low ceiling heights do not permit a wall mounting height of a 2.03, then it can be mounted within 150 of the ceiling. Okay, so there's a limit, there's a exemption. If you have a low ceiling height, then if you cannot maintain this 2.03, then it's permitted to be mounted within 150 of the ceiling. Okay. 150 millimeters of the ceiling. So this is how we design our visible appliance for each candela, one light, no, per room. Let's say one room, we have one light. For 15 candela, there's a coverage of 6.10. Okay. So this is the coverage of 15 candela, 6.1. If you have a 30 candela, coverage is 8.53. If you have a 34 and so on, these are the coverage. Okay? So if you have, uh, in let's say for example in 12.2. Okay? Now, for ceiling mounted visible appliances, there will be the same a coverage for 3 meters height. These are the coverage for different type of candela. So, for 15 to 75 candela, your maximum ceiling height shall be 3 meters. So, these are the coverage. But, if your ceiling height is more than is uh, more than three and within six point one meters, you can use this candela thirty, forty five, seventy five, eighty. So you will not see this fifteen candela anymore. So instead it's replaced by thirty with the coverage of six point one. So we will just use this, okay? Based on the ceiling height, the type of uh The candela rating that we're going to use will vary, okay? This is how we design it. Let's say, what is the coverage for wall mounted? 12.2, remember? For 12.2, it's 60 candela, one light only. So that's why here we have only one light in the middle. Okay? This is how you provide the coverage. So at the middle, one half of 12.2 is here and here. So total coverage is 12.2. 12.2, same with 15 candela. 15 candela is only 6.1, right? 6.1, okay. So that's why he use, we use here one 15 candela only. Same, same with this because it's only 6.1. Okay, so one only. And here is uh, less than 6.1. This is how we design our flasher okay make sure that every point in the rooms are covered by the flasher then the last chapter under any page have been two will be the emergency control flasher interface so like what I explained in the the last part in I mean the last major I mean the last component of fire alarm which is modules for controlling the interface now these are the interface that the fire alarm is uh, controlling. One is elevator recall. Okay, so in elevator recall, we're installing smoke detector for recall of elevator mainly in elevator lobby or inside the elevator hoist, elevator shop, or and the other one is from the elevator pit. But we are only installing smoke detector at the shop or in the pit if we have a sprinkler 
inside the shop or in the pit. But if we don't have a smoke detector inside the pit or elevator shop, then we don't need smoke detector. But we know we need only smoke detector in the elevator lobby. That smoke detector shall be located within 6.4 meters from the center line of each elevator door. Okay. Then, oh, this is the requirement. So like what I said earlier, smoke detector shall not be required in a sprinkler. That's why if there's no sprinkler in the elevator shop or in the elevator pit, you don't need to install smoke detector. Okay. But um, and another one, if you're installing modules, make sure that it's installed within one meters of it is uh, one meters of the component it, it controls. Okay. So if your controllers for elevators are are the components that the power alarm will control, then the control module shall, shall be installed within one meter of that elevator controller. Okay. So if sprinklers are required in hallways and elevator pit, then we have to provide a smoke detector in that area. Okay? So in case if um, there is a fire detected in the within the shop it shall um, bring the elevator down to the ground floor or in the elevator recall mode first before the sprinkler will activate we don't want people still in the elevator when the sprinkler activated otherwise there will be like a risk of fire I mean there is in electrical okay so that is why when there's already a, when there's a sprinkler requirement inside the shop or in the elevator pit, then we require to have a smoke detector. So it will recall first the elevator to the ground floor so people can go out of the elevator first before the sprinkler will activate. Otherwise, there will be a risk to the people inside the shop. And once you install sprinkler, and make sure that um, you also install a heat detector that one I will discuss in the next slides okay so you have to install heat detector within 610 of each sprinkler so what why why is uh, why is it required to have heat detector placed in each sprinkler the purpose of this is if you have a sprinkler inside the elevator shop or elevator pit before the sprinkler activates that elevator also shall be shut down already no power just to make sure that no electrocution will happen if in case the sprinkler activates okay there's a difference between the function of smoke detector and heat detector in the hoistway in the elevator shop the sprinkler is to recall the people and let them out of the elevator before the sprinkler activates so they're safe and heat detector is uh, the input requires uh, required to make sure that there is no power before the sprinkler or sprinkler activates okay the next uh, emergency control function um, to interface is HBA control so if we have this duct detector installed from smoke in return like what we discussed earlier once this duct smoke duct uh, duct smoke mounted uh, I mean that uh, duct smoke detector mounted at the H back duct from both return and supply once those detectors are activated that shall shut down the AHU immediately so that it will not recirculate the smoke within the building or stop the fan from uh, spreading the smoke coming from the motors if it's coming from the motor to the building okay so that is the one and the other one is if we have door and shutter hold open hold open let's say in hospital we have some 
uh, fire or smoke compartmentation there you will mention uh, you will notice that there's a double door which is uh, normally held open and in case of fire that will close that is to isolate the area of uh, uh, that uh, particular area in the hospital to the other area within the fire compartmentation or smoke compartmentation so in case of fire there should be also interface for that one to release that so it will close and same with electric electors some doors in buildings are so are, are with security access control system which is normally lock and those have access only will can open the door in case of fire those doors shall be open automatically okay but there are some there are some um, uh, another requirement sometimes from security uh, where we have sensitive or important uh, important things to protect they are exempted sometimes from these electrical actors okay provided that there is an emergency uh, manual switch inside so people can immediately go out in case of fire and there are also other uh, modules required for interface of fire smoke damper like what I said earlier this is to control the fire smoke damper to, uh, from closing when in the embed of fire so the fire resistance of the wall where the duct penetrates we can still maintain that resistance okay fire resistance okay let's go now to NFA 90A this is the standard for the installation of air conditioning and ventilating system uh, we will discuss uh, again the scope before we use this this standard shall cover construction installation operation and maintenance of systems for air conditioning and ventilating including filters ducts and related equipment to protect life and property from fire smoke gases resulting from fire or from condition having manifestations similar to fire okay guys so we will move on chapter six where we need this is only the chapter where it's related to fire alarm so we'll move to this chapter okay so for 6.4.2.1 smoke detectors are required in air handling units when uh, in the supply side when your capacity is greater than 2000 cubic feet per minute so take note of this when we have an air supply from the supply side having a capacity of 2000 uh, cfm then we need to have a duct detector installed the supply side and if we have a, a capacity of uh, 15 cubic for cubic feet per minute in the return side then we need also to have duct detector and at the same time at each story prior to the connection to the common return then we need also to provide duct detector on that side return smoke return system smoke detectors shall not be required when the entire space served by air distribution system is protected by area smoke detector so when your air handling units serving all areas in that areas uh, have smoke detector installed air detector then that is the time that we don't require duct detector installed from the return okay so there's an exemption and if your smoke detector if the sole function of pan is for removing air only from the inside building directly to the outside of the building then also it's not required to install smoke detector to this fan okay If it's not clear for you guys this two this so these are the requirement right if you're not clear in this part at each story this is this uh, the same with which I show in duct detector before let's move to that one duct detector okay this one before the compartment moves to the I mean move to the common uh, return 
there should be a duct detector. That is the one. Each story. So this is ground level. You need one here. This is another level. You need another here. And then, to the, the what we are um, telling here, what we mentioned here, the return, common return is the common return to the AHU itself, which is the main common return. To the HU, okay. So aside from each story going to the common return from the riser, we need to have another detector from the common return duct to the HU, which is near to the HU already. That duct common return to the HU shall have duct detector. And at the same time, from the supply side, from within the HU near to the HU, we need to have duct detector. Now we will move on NAPE 70. This is uh, the code that we need for installation of wirings, cables, okay, for fire alarm. So we will just um, move in chapter, in article, uh, article 760 is the uh, chapter in NAPE 70 that discuss about the requirements for fire alarm. But we will move directly to um, table 760.179 because these are the cables that we commonly use in fire alarm. Yeah, what you will see here is FPLP, FPLR, FPL. We need to make sure that there is some markings from the cable that we use in fire alarm. Okay, so the only three, uh, the three um, mostly used as a fire alarm cables are the FPLP, which means Power Limited Fire Alarm Plenum Cable. These are the cable used in Plenum. Power Limited Fire Alarm Riser. These are the Fire Alarm Cable used in Riser. And Fire Alarm Limited Fire Alarm Cable, APL, which is the General Fire Alarm Cable. Okay? So, PLFA, Power Limited Fire Alarm Cable, is told as wiring within buildings shall be listed as being fire resistant to the spread of fire and other criteria in accordance with A to H. So what is A to H? This is the one. Conductors shall be solid or standard. Okay. So the size of conductor and monthly conductor cable shall not be smaller than 26. Yes. Single conductor shall not be smaller than 18. Okay. Uh, in Middle East, mostly they are using 16 gauge, gauge 16 for, for this. Or 14 for NAC. And the cable shall have a voltage rating, uh, rating of not less than 300 volts. Okay. Then these are the character of FLP. FLP, uh, power limited for alarm plenum cable shall be listed as being suitable for use in DACs in plenum. That's why if you are installing cables inside the plenum or space used for environmental air, those cables shall be listed for plenum at the same time should be resistant radicate uh, fire resistant and low smoke reducing characteristic same with the fire alarm riser when you use your cable for vertical run in the shaft or from floor to floor it should have a fire resistant characteristic okay from floor to floor and the same time we the last one is the fel FPL is the power limited fire alarm cable shall be listed as being suitable for general purpose fire alarm use with the exception of riser dax plenums, okay? The, the, the other two one. So this is how we check their applicability where it's, uh, no, um, where it is allowed to use these cables. So in dax plenum, we can use FPLP, plenum, yes, or FPLR, no. So you will see here, it's not permitted. But if you install the FPLR in the metal raceway or in a conduit, then you can use FPLR and FPL2. So that is a different. That is the difference. Okay. And for for risers, vertical runs, you can install FPLP even if it's for plenum. But 
the general cable cannot be used. But if you install cables in a metal raceway for APLP, APLR, and APL, they all can be used for riser application. And within buildings, anywhere in the building, any pipings, you can install general. You can install APLP or APLR or APL. Let's use here. Yes, yes. There's no limitation. Okay, they're all yes. There's no problem. Okay, guys. Now that we finished this uh, fundamentals for designing, now we will go to the actual designing of fire alarm samples. I have a sample here using CAD. Okay, guys, this is one sample of our drawing. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, when we are designing for, for alarm, there are related references. So far, we discussed every any related any PA that we need for designs, except for any PA 170. So any PA 72, guys, we discussed this. 70, 98, 101, right? But 70, no. Because I will just show you these symbols. Any page 170 is just the symbols used for designing uh, fire protection, including fire alarm. So these symbols are already um, based on any page 170. So this is how we design our fire alarm. From the symbols, it shall be done as per NEP 170, and for the design, it shall be designed as per 72, 70, 98. So let's go. Let's check how we do this design. This is a sample of substation in one of my projects. I will not name it. But this is for the purpose of education only. So before I design this, you will not see any of these cables around here. First thing that you, you need to do is to locate first the fire alarm devices that you need. Okay, so there will be no wiring. So first, you have to show first whatever services that you have in that particular floor. Let's say this is a cable basement of the substation. In cable basement, we have ventilation ducts, supply and return. So these are the ventilation, supply and return installed in the cable basement. And at the same time, there is also a lot of cable trays. So these are all cable trays, guys. And aside from this, I have also the layout of structural. So basically, before you can start with the design, in the design, make sure that from the architectural drawings, these are the architectural, you need to make sure that the beams or the structural layout are already incorporated in your architectural and at the same time your equipment layout like the HVAC duct, the cable trays, which we need for determining the location of your detector. So now that we have this, we can now locate our detector. As you will see here, like what I mentioned, uh, I mentioned earlier that this should be far from the diffuser, but guys, this detector installed from the ceiling and these diffusers are installed at lower height of the basement. So it's not directly uh, blowing air or returning air from the diffuser. They're on different elevation, okay? So don't worry, uh, don't worry about this location. 
So you will see here, I just uh, move it away from the dock because for easy maintenance. You remember in NAPA 72, there's a clause that I discussed should be located for easy access. Okay, so as much as possible, you have to make sure that your detector is located far from the dock so it can be easily accessed or not above the cable tray. These are the cable trays. It's not this uh, in magenta. It's not in the cable tray, above the cable. They are all away from the cable tray. And at the same time, you have to take care of these um, structural beams. So in my part, in my situation here, uh, I have the uh, I, I have this uh, complete detail of structural, where it shows that the beam depth of the beams are more than in this part are more than 10%. That's why in my design here I considered more than 10% and the distance between beams beam is more than 40% of the ceiling height. Do you remember what I discussed earlier here? Okay, we will check again. Smoke detector, okay. If beam depth is more than 10% and the spacing between beams are more than 40% of the ceiling height, then spot type detector shall be located in each beam packet. This is why in this drawing, I consider each packet with detector. For pull station, F, what is F? Addressable manual call point or a pull station, okay? They shall, remember, pull station shall be installed in each exit. This is your exit door. And I have two staircase. So in each staircase exit door, I installed pull station and at the same time I need to uh, I need to make sure that this call pull station are located within 1.5 meters from the entry so it's near to the door okay this is my horn strobe okay in my part in my design here I have two only because the area is too small. Actually, it's around how much? 5, 10, uh, 5. Let's say 12. That's 4, 16. It's around 20 meters length or additional here. 26 meters. 26 meters here by 11 by 17 by 18 meters. So. Two horn strobe is enough to cover this, and the minimum sound pressure level as per specification in this in my project is 65 dB only. Okay, so you remember that your detector shall be this. I mean your sounder shall be designed based on the ambient sound level. So in our case, in substation, it was already um, designed that the substation, that the maximum, I mean the, the ambient sound pressure level expected is around 50. That's why in our design, we're designing plus 15 for public mode is 15, so 65. We're maintaining 65 dB here. When you have a 65 dB um sound pressure level to maintain the distance between detector can reach up to within between a uh, 40 so like the coverage is around 20 you will you can still meet there is a calculation for that but um i will not be discussing here so you can clearly um uh know determine that your coverage for sounder is enough 
but here it's not required anymore because it's, this area is very small. So having two in each exit with pool station because most of the time they are in the isolation they're with each other. So having two here is safe. See? Like what I said, the distance between uh, between sounder can reach up to 20 meters if you're maintaining, uh, 40 meters if you're maintaining a sound pressure level of 65. This is based on calculation. Okay. So now that I distributed all the detectors and call points, manual pull station, and I have also I have the manual means, I have the automatic that uh, automatic initiating device which is smoke detector. I have my occupant notification or audible notification appliance uh, distributed within the building. Then. I'm ready now to do the wirings. So what you will see here, I started from these devices. Why? Because from ground floor, uh, actually the panel is coming from first floor. I will show you first the first floor. The panel is located from control panel relay room. This is actually where my specs require uh, no requires to install the panel, so I just follow the requirements. But it can be installed from the main entrance of ground level. But in our case, uh, the HJ here is requiring us to install the panel within the man location, which is the control and panel reader room. Okay, where operators are sitting here in this workstation. So. They are requiring us to install our control panel to this man location, okay? It's like fire command center or like what I said earlier in our requirements in NAP 101, the constantly attended location. This is where, this is the one. So from panel, going to that riser, going to basement. So this is my first detector. Okay? And so on, guys. Like in ground floor, I will show you one sample again. The last one, ground floor. So I have another loop. One loop for basement, one loop for ground floor. So most of the time, that is how we design our, our wirings for fire alarm. For each floor, we're providing uh, a separate loop. But it depends. If you have uh, a lot of spares, still a lot of spares from the loop, you can continue this loop from other floor. But it depends again if the specs requires you to provide separate, depends eh. So, even if your loop can provide a lot of devices, one loop, if the specs require one loop per floor, then you have to follow that one, okay? So here in GIS, I have a high ceiling here, more than 9 meters. So here we're, we're proposing beam detector. Remember earlier for high ceiling, beam detector is the best uh, detection to, to use. Maximum distance is 101 as per manufacturer, but actually the distance from the site is only 16.8. So this is more. So in one, this area, uh, the, rather than having a lot of smoke detector, which is very hard to maintain because of high level ceiling, you have only one, which can cover the whole building, uh, the whole uh, room. That's why it's, uh, it has an advantage of, for maintaining. So each exit again, I have call point sounder. Oh, I have exit again here, call point sounder. Exit, exit, and I have a lot of detector here because I have a beam here which has more than 10% and spacing between beams are more than 40% of the ceiling height. So each packet I have, but actually this room can be covered only by one at the middle. But there's another requirement from specs that for Swiss gear, they require minimum of two for each packet. So... That is another requirement. 
instead of having one only we provided two so this is how we design our this is how we design the fire alarm make sure that you first put all the required services along with the uh, architectural before you design your before you locate your detection so it's already coordinated okay then after that once you already um, superimpose all the required services such like HVAC, cable trays lightings everything then you can uh, you can only proceed with the location of your devices okay Guys, this is the installation details that I promised earlier that I will show you. Okay, for mounting of fire alarm control panel, you you will see here the recommended um, mounting height for panel, which is in my side, it's 1.8 meters from the top. So that this indicator or LCD from the panel within the view 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 of the people who will uh, check the information from the panel so mostly guys this mounting height for APCPR 1.8 for repeater is the same 1.8 if you have a repeater and these are the detector these are the horn strobe sounder flasher so like this is for NPA 2.25. Okay. First pull station 1.2. This is the operable part. I remember from 1.03 to 1. Point something 26. So it's within this limit. So we standardize the installation height for MPS to 1.2. As this is what I shown earlier for location of smoke detector in when we have a beam construction. Okay, so that's it, guys. Thank you for your time. For more video tutorials, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up. And subscribe to my channel. Hit the notification bell too so you will be updated. See you in my next video. Bye guys. Thanks.